started, man. Uh, so I want to welcome everyone to our May Share Token Tech Talks, which we're going to bring in April, because I'm just lazy. Uh, and we are now going to take off the rest of summer because I'm really busy and lazy. It's kind of a combination of both. Um, but we've got four really great presenters tonight. I'll get our today. Um, so we have two presenters, and then we have two people that are going to demo apps or software or websites that they made at a uh, hack upstate uh, about a month and a half ago. Um, everyone presenting tonight is a repeat offender, so they've been here multiple times. Mugs is like fifth time offender, I think is what it is, right? No? Yeah, so every time we have any users, I try to get an so uh, it kind of fails me. Uh, so if you've been here before, we like to kind of go over a couple different stats. Uh, I started this about a year, almost two years ago now. Um, so we now, part of our meetup group, have uh, nine, uh, sorry, 697 members. Uh, and that's up from 619 about a month and a half ago. We have 537 followers of our at Share Token Tech. So if you're not following it, that's the only way I announce these tech talks. So you've got to follow the uh, in the know. Uh, and that's up from 487. So we have uh, roughly 100 new users. Uh, we've got 22 YouTube uh, channel subscribers. If you follow me, that's like a big thing. Because like a couple months ago, we had 20 and then we lost one. Who turns off a YouTube channel subscriber? So we're down to 19, but now we're up to 22. Uh, we've got 5 or 16 views. We've got videos from, from almost every tech talk, and usually I try and break them up into each presenters. We've got a couple where the camera turned off. The battery died. My cell phone records crappy video. So uh, we are recording tonight. I always like to make a general announcement. If you don't want a video on video, don't come in this general area right here. So. And that's about it. So um, usually what we'll do is we'll do uh, one presentation. It's going to have to be really good here tonight. We're going to take little pauses in between there. Usually when we do a pause, I like to ask everybody to turn to the left and right and introduce yourself to someone you don't already know. Try and get to know people in your community. So uh, first up is Daniel with uh, we're just going to call it Google Geek. First time I've used the mic, so if uh, you can't hear me, speak up. <clears throat> so my name is Daniel, and I have a local game design studio. Try to get away from the speaker. I have a local game design studio, and uh... all right, that should work. So I know a little bit about making video games. Naturally, I'd like to take something about making video games and expand it into other areas. And the best way to do that would be with something called gamification, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with on some level. Gamification is mainly used for customer engagement. We'll get to the boring part now. Uh, Gamification in general means taking aspects of game design and applying them to non-game elements. So, taking levels, rewards, points, uh, competitions, trophies, achievements, and using them to either encourage people, customers, or um, just pretty much anybody to be more involved with the product. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you different kinds of gamification in different fields and see how it's used in different ways. So our first type of gamification is going to be in the marketing. Uh, mainly successfully used in this case for a game called Exploding Kittens. Exploding Kittens is a card based game, so it's an analog game. It was on Kickstarter. They were looking to raise $10,000. They raised almost $9 million for their game. Uh, it kind of also helps that they had the people from the OVO behind it. The main, rate, the main way they did this was through gamifying their Kickstarter campaign. So what they did was they created badges and achievements to engage their backers and they tried to get their backers to spread uh, social media campaigns, uh, get more backers, Twitter, Facebook, um, overfunding the project. And the main way they did this was by promising everyone an upgrade to their Kickstarter if they backed the project. So 
even the lowest donation got their reward upgraded if they helped achieve these different uh, badges and achievements. So as you can see, it was funded, 10,000% funded. They had 100,000 backers, uh, most back campaign ever, and uh, somehow someone posted five photos of weaponized back there. Not really sure how, but they did. So that's one way you could use gamification and marketing to help spread your product and your campaign and to help engage your customer base. This is what most people are familiar with when it comes to gamification and its most basic level. This here is a Starbucks app and it's, like it says on the screen, basic. You spend money, you get points, you get small rewards. There's not much to it. And this is what most people associate with gamification. You know, you go to McDonald's and you get Monopoly pieces and stuff like that. It's really uh, not great. It's really basic, and if you break it down, I think I was looking at the app, you would have to spend roughly about $75 worth of coffee to get a free croissant at Starbucks. So, uh, not really worth it. So, the next way to use gamification is what could also be known as edutainment. In this case, this is a website called Code Combat. Code Combat teaches people how to program and code in different languages by having them use the code to play a video game. So in this case, you have your warrior here, and your warrior has to dodge four fireballs, and to get him to dodge four fireballs is to actually write the code over there on the side to get him to move around. There are other websites that use this as well. Um, what is it? No, I can't think of any right now, but Code Combat's the biggest one. And this uses all kinds of code. You pick what you want to learn, and then it applies that to playing the game. They also have community-run events where, like, you know, you have to fend off a horde of zombies by programming the solution and, and controlling your army through code. And you learn the levels as the levels progress, you learn more complicated code. They also use gamification for personal growth. In this case, this is an app for your phone called Zombies Run. So it uses, you can either use an external like pedometer, like Fitbit, or you can use your built-in pedometer. And what you do is you create an account, you log in, and you are a character in a story. You're a runner, you're in a post-apocalyptic zombie-filled world, and you your job is to run out and gather supplies. So as you're running, you'll start hearing the sound of zombies in your ear, which means that it's time for you to do a sprint. Except you can turn this off if you're in like, you know, urban areas, so you don't sprint into the middle of the street trying to get away from imaginary zombies. But, and as you run, you're collecting resources. And then when you finish your run, you use the resources you collect by physically running in the world to build up your base and save off zombie invasions. And then as you're running, the story is also progressing. You get like you, you get like parts of the story given to you by your handler, which is one of like the characters in the story. There's different modes. There's a drop-off mode, so you could pick a destination and you have to run to that destination and back with the supplies that you've caught. And then we get to my personal favorite. This is called Habitica. It used to be called Habit RPG. So what it is, is it turns your habits, daily routines, task lists, pretty much anything you do every day into a role-playing game. So you're given a basic character and you create a list of good habits and bad habits. And whenever you perform your bad habits, you lose hit points. And whenever you perform your good habits, you, um, you gain experience and eventually levels. And as you gain levels, you gain currency, and you gain um, equipment, and generally leveling up a character. Then, after you level up your character for a bit, 
you join social groups together to fight like raid bosses essentially. And the raid bosses are beaten by achieving your habits and daily routines every day. And the boss does damage to the entire group if somebody skips their routine. So if you have a party of 10 and you're taking on a boss and somebody didn't feel like going to the gym one day, the entire group gets hurt for it. Um, this can also be used for, they also have like a corporate aspect of this where if you want to motivate your employees at work, you can create corporate websites using Habitica and then your employees can reach achievements and milestones and gain experience for performing in a certain way. Personally, I use this mainly for, like to keep me from doing bad things. Like I found that as a personal motivator, I'm less likely to go pick up a bag of chips at Stewart's if I'm losing hit points. Then I am more likely, I'm not really likely to go to the gym to gain experience. So my character's been at level two for a really long time. Like it was, a, it, it was a, it's a good motivator to not do things, but when you don't have a lot of people also playing the game with you, it's not a great motivator to get things done. Um, I mean, that basically sums up the some of the different forms of gamification. There are many, many more out there. There are many more out there. Uh, one of my favorites is Code Academy. Code Academy is uh, also another learning how to code website, and it gives you achievements and badges and, and experience levels for completing courses. But then the courses also give you practical skills, like Code Academy just uploaded a uh, how to create and host your own website course. And if you complete the course, you get special badges and achievements for doing so. Um, there's a whole slew of them out there. I just wanted to give you guys just a couple. Uh, that's pretty much it. Any questions for Daniel? We usually don't let him off the hook so we have at least one question from the audience. Don't feel obligated. <laughs> Seriously, nothing? Yeah. Alright, another round of applause for the So uh, here's Mel Jean Seth. Hello, and as Chris said, it's not my first time, so I don't know how much I need to say about myself. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm Mel and Mr. Seth. Uh, we worked together at Maglory for a few years, um, but mostly what we've been doing lately is hacking on projects uh, and things like that in the evenings and weekends. Uh, and we've been making some pretty awesome stuff. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about um, hacking and it being for everyone. Because uh, I think some people think that uh, doing side projects and going to hackathons and things like that is primarily for developers. But really, I think hacking and hackathons are for everyone. Uh, yes, they're for developers, but they're for designers as well, also for marketers and for managers. Yes, for everyone. Um, but you know, why, if, if, you want, if you're interested in hackathons, why would you go to a hackathon? I mean, I've used hackathons for learning new languages, learning new skills, you know, stuff that you can't use in your regular job just because you don't have the time um, or you don't have the opportunity just to try new things. And so you're able to experiment with new technology, new ideas, uh, but you also get the opportunity to work with new people in new ways. Finding potential new hires or if you're looking for a new job, maybe working with somebody you might be able to work with. Um, and you get to do things that you wouldn't normally do. So I'm primarily a developer, but sometimes a hackathon you don't have somebody with design skills on your team, so you get to do that too. Or if you're a designer, maybe you get to do a little bit of HTML or CSS as well, just learn some new skills. 
Um, and I think primarily hackathons are, yeah, they're not, they're not just for learning, they're not just for hypothetical things, they're actually for do, doing something, they're actually there to kind of make a new uh, app or a new website. So everybody should know how that, how that works. So if you have an idea for an app that you want to build, what is the process that it takes to go from that idea to something that you can launch? And, and, and at a hackathon, you will learn that. And you also get to speak the same language with people. So if you do have that idea that you want to work on and you want to explain that idea to somebody, if you go through the process of a hackathon, you'll get to learn all the same terminology, all the same languages that people use to describe their idea. And so when you want to explain something, you can actually speak to, you can speak to people in, in a way that everybody understands each other. Um, and maybe you should know what everybody's role is. So if somebody is a developer or a designer, um, I'm really understanding what they do. So taking that idea and how do you make that into something uh, and understanding what people do so that when, 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 when you go back to your page on you just have a, 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 a like appreciation of what people do and kind of how they contribute. Um, so, I just want to say that. I mean, I think, I think everybody, everybody should attend a hackathon. I, I think it's a lot of fun. Um, so, the I did go to a hackathon recently. Went to Pack Up State, um, which is actually over in, in Syracuse. And so, while we were at the hackathon, we did work on uh, a project. Um, we actually went there with the, with, with the thought of not actually. Uh, doing the actual hackathon itself because we we're actually in the process of launching a tool um, called Hack Assist for managing hackathons. So I mean, we actually went to Hack Up State in October because uh, they have um, hackathons every six months at, at, at the Hack Up State and we found out that the tool that they used to manage their hackathon online was actually being shut down. Uh, and so we had the idea during that hackathon to kind of build a tool, uh, but we didn't have time during that hackathon to build it. Uh, so in between, we kind of worked on this idea of, well, maybe we should just build a tool that, that we can use to kind of manage the next hackathon. And so we kind of we kind of went with the idea of, well, we're going to add features to Hack Assist, we're going to see it out there in use, and kind of see what people thought about it. Uh, and I'm actually going to pull it up. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, sorry if this screeches. Um, so Mubs is pulling up the website. Um, Hack Assist is Hack Assist is like a, it's a website platform that anybody can host um, hackathon events. Um, as you can see here, um, you know we have featured. It's really hard to see. You can, we have featured. Um, this is the home page. We have featured. Hackathons. We have uh, hackathons that are happening now, and hackathons that are that have ended. So this is a really quick, easy tool that we created um, in the, the time between hackathons. Um, so primarily, when we went to Hack Up State, all we did was polish, and we just wanted to make sure that everything ran smoothly. This guy's going to be talking later. Um, so, anyways, this is just a simple tool. It's a web tool, um, and if you want to click on that mobs, this is actually what we built. So we came up with this idea all clear. Um, I think it was like at 8 p.m. So we only had six hours to do this uh, idea. And all clear is a iPhone app that um, it's basically if you want to go to the park and you don't know which park to go to, there's many in the park. That's why it's called Clifton Park. Uh, um, anyways, there's many parks in Clifton Park, and if you don't know which one to go to, um, you can check the weather. Uh, and all you have to do is open your iPhone app, um, open the iPhone app, and what it does is it checks uh, Foursquare API and connects with um, Dark Sky, and it tells you what the weather is in each individual park. So we built this in six hours, uh, the website and the functionality, and I'll probably hand this over to Bob so he can show you the demo. Uh, yeah, so 
we didn't actually get to the point where it was like live in the app store and stuff, but I, we did have it working in the app, uh, in the emulator. So you can kind of see here is, um, is the iOS emulator. So it starts up, you kind of launch the app, it figures out where you are, uh, finds, the, finds the parks around the area, and because we're running in the emulator, it's just using the location for Apple's headquarters. Um, and so you can see it found some of the parks nearby and it kind of shows you what the weather is for the next hour around those parks and it looks like it's going to be clear and sunny unfortunately in or, or fortunately I guess uh, close to Apple's offices so you can pretty much pick, you can pick any park to go to but, um, but the idea was that there's lots of little micro climates around all of these um, areas so even though it might be clear and sunny for uh, a park that's to the east, on the west it may be about to rain and, and things like that. So, uh, so, so the idea is that it, with, 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 with an app like this you can really, really quickly see what the weather will be like uh, in, into parks around you. Uh, and then ultimately it didn't have to be just, just for um, local parks, it could actually be if you're on a holiday uh, in Cape Cod, for example, there's probably five or six beaches around you. So maybe you want to know which which uh, which beach is going to have the warmest weather. So you can also choose a sort of other things as well. So that's kind of where the idea is. Uh, it will, will, will eventually be headed. Um, but that's pretty much our presentation. Um, And uh, thanks for listening, and you can follow us on Twitter, and uh, if you have any questions, I can answer them. Yes, down front. Yes. Uh, I was just wondering if you like, people measure things like wind or black eyes or other things other than, than clear skies. That was, um, that's kind of the idea. Um, we when we had this idea of all when we kind of came up to this with this idea at APM, we are like, well, you know, in the winter time, for example, uh, I live in Boston Spa, there's a Target in uh, Saratoga, and there's a Target in Clifton Park. Well, everybody knows the snow is up here, um, so why can't it tell me, you know, uh, which Target to go to? Or, so what your, your question was, um, can it tell us, like, um, you know, what's the condition of the parks, right? Is uh, there a possibility to have black flies, or I think anything's really possible, given the time constraint that you have to create something. So really this was a six hour project, um, and when, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you can just build whatever else you want on it. Anyone else? Round of applause. Thank you so much.
be in politics or things. So an organization in Amsterdam called all right, guys, so this is a project that I worked on at um, Backup State. Um, and I'll just start by saying that it was such a valuable experience to be a designer. Um, you know, Seth can actually talk to this. There weren't, there weren't many designers there at all. So it was actually really cool to work with a developer who normally hasn't really worked with a designer. And hearing his idea and kind of offering different perspectives based on different UI applications was really cool. It was a really cool experience and, uh, you know, I kind of made myself sleep, but I couldn't really go. <laughs> so um, the app is called Zoop. Um, and with, you know, I'll give you a little background on the name. Um, I was watching, I was listening to a podcast uh, that Kevin Smith was being interviewed on. He had directed an episode of Flash. And one of the words he said was, when Flash comes into a scene, they call it Zoot. Um, I thought that was a really cool name. And actually, the name kind of really fits the way the app is. So you'll kind of see when I kind of go through some of the screens and the demo, that it, it almost kind of gives you superpowers a little bit. So the, the um, lightning bolt is a little nod to Flash, um, along with the name. So Zoom is an iOS app that allows users to reveal moments in time that they would normally be too slow to see with, you, with the human eye. Uh, the, the UI is set up as a side-by-side -side layout, um, so the user really can see what they're recording. Um, and the, the full recording comes in at uh, 5 seconds. So if they record 25 seconds of video, it's compressed into 5 seconds. If they record 15 seconds of video, it's compressed into 5 seconds. So, um, so if we have a little internet issues, it's going to be a little difficult, so kind of bear with me. So the, the UI is still kind of getting worked on a little bit. We still have a working prototype, but um, a lot of the UI elements are missing. So this is just a flat screenshot. So you can see um, the side-by-side -side layout. Um, on the left here, this is the reactive window that you're recording in. Uh, on the right is where the five-second scenes kind of appear. So as you're recording, these little, little bars indicate how many sessions that you have um, have recorded. So as you're recording, it dumps it into the, the right-hand window and it cuts to five seconds. And then it dumps it again when you record, say, 10 seconds of video, but it dumps it again in five seconds, and kind of so on and so forth. Um, and like one of the ideas that came up during the presentation that Seth had would be a really cool idea to be able to swipe one of the bars out to edit and take away five seconds in case the camera moves or something kind of gets in the way kind of do real-time editing, which is a really cool feature. Um, and you know, one of the ideas that kind of came up as we were kind of brainstorming was I was kind of pointing out the different bars, and you know, the developer whose name was John was like, oh, you really didn't think about it that way. So it was a kind of, that, that was kind of happened a lot in the process of coming up with UI ideas based on his idea, but um, stuff that he had never really thought of that really kind of played out over the course of the 24 hours. So as you're recording, um, you get a little processing notification, and then it dumps the video over. And as you're recording different sessions, these, these uh, bars kind of light up. And when you're done, you can preview it, you can post to Twitter, you can post to Instagram, you can do a Giphy of it, or you can just save it to your camera roll or do another one. So I'm going to attempt to kind of show you guys a really rough prototype. Let's see if I can get a work.
can see as we're recording the episode, we're recording on the, the street. Um, let me back it up a little bit, guys. There you go. So he's, he's, about, he's about to record the street. And it's a little, a little hard to see. Oh, there we go. So as, as he's recording, um, you're going to see the right hand frame and kind of jump over to the other side and it'll, it'll start compressing it. It'll start getting faster and faster. So anytime he's going to hit the record button. Thank you very much, everyone.